program for this week is very vast. We will be hearing stuff about mathematics, uh, computer science. Um, and so I was thinking, how does that, what I do fit into the whole week? I'm um, working on, on logic and foundations uh, in particular. And today's talk, my talk will be about uh, foundations for uh, formalizing category theory, higher category theory, potentially um, in computer proof systems. Yeah, so I want to explain today a little bit, and it will be a very introductory talk. I want to explain how uh, univalent foundations um, are kind of a, a suitable um, foundation to formalize category theory and higher category theory. Feel free to interrupt me any time. I really want it to be accessible to everyone. So if something is unclear, then it's probably a good idea for you to ask a question. OK. Um, why, why category theory? Why, is that, um, why does that deserve um, foundations on its own, possibly? Uh, well, category theory is um, kind of peculiar in, the, in that it is about sameness of mathematical objects. And that's a central notion in category theory. And what is interesting is that this notion of sameness, it, it, it depends on, this, on the mathematical objects that we are studying. In particular, when we are studying categories themselves uh, as, as objects, then the notion of sameness uh, that within a category is given by isomorphism becomes something more complicated when we consider uh, sameness between categories. It becomes uh, Equivalence, yeah. And if we look at higher categories and study sameness between higher categories, this notion of sameness becomes even looser. Yeah. So there's an, an, an evolving notion of sameness between mathematical objects and univalent foundations, and that's something that I want to discuss today. Um, allows one to express reasoning exactly modulo the appropriate notion of sameness between mathematical objects. Okay. Sounds very abstract so far. Uh, hopefully, it will be more concrete at the end of the talk. Uh, I have three topics that I would like to discuss. I would like to give a motivation for univalent foundations, uh, then a brief technical description of what univalent foundations are, and then discuss a few points about how to formalize category theory in univalent foundations. Okay. Um, Let's start very philosophically uh, with this um, principle, uh, indiscernibility of identicals, which is a logical principle. It says that if two objects, x and y, if they're equal, then they satisfy all the same properties p. Okay, so if p is a property, uh, then x uh, is as a predicate, x satisfies p if and only if y satisfies uh, p. Um, this is a purely logical principle in the sense that it doesn't take into account the nature of x and y. So um, it's also not a very useful property because often we cannot prove that x is equal to y. We note that x and y are somehow similar but uh, not necessarily equal. So in mathematics when we do reasoning, we want the reasoning to be invariant under weaker notions of sameness. Okay? Um, so, what I will call the equivalence principle during this talk um, is this slogan, reasoning in mathematics should be invariant under the appropriate notion of sameness. And appropriate here means depending on x and y, on what these things are. For instance, if I study groups and I have two groups, G and H, that are isomorphic, then I want to consider properties that are invariant under uh, isomorphism of groups. Yeah. And let me just call these group theoretic properties. Yeah, these are the properties that a group theorist would study on groups. Um, so here, two things are important. Firstly, this notion of sameness depends on the, math on the mathematical objects, G and H, that I study, on, on, on what kind of things they are, and then usually um, I have to restrict myself to certain kinds of properties that are the interesting ones that are invariant. If I look at an equivalence principle for categories, then firstly I have a different notion of sameness between objects, namely equivalence of categories. 
And I'm certainly interested in different properties, namely category theoretic ones, that I, want, that I expect to be invariant under equivalence. Okay. Benedict? Yeah? But is this like a definition of what it means for a property to be category theoretic, or are you saying you have some pre-existing notions? That's a great question. There are no definitions yet so far. This is just uh, usually what I mean to say by this is um, when we do set theoretic mathematics, we cannot expect all properties to be invariant. And we might ask ourselves, which ones are the properties that are invariant? Okay. Is it fair to say that in some sense it's kind of trying to reverse the implication that is you, you want to say that your group theoretic properties are exactly the ones so that P of G equals to P, is equivalent to P of H for any set of properties P, right? The cool thing is that at the end of the talk in Univalent Foundations, it will turn out that I don't need to discuss, I don't need to restrict the properties that I look at. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's more about finding a good balance. If you take too many properties, then your notion of sameness is too strong. If you take too few, or it might be the wrong notion, given what you're trying to achieve. So one can ask what are the structural properties. Uh, one can ask what are not structural properties. And here I have a small exercise for you. I have drawn a, an equivalence of categories. Uh, um, these two categories are equivalent, but not all properties uh, are invariant under this equivalence. Does anybody know a property? The number of objects. That's because it's small, but that's the same. <laughs> Fantastic. That's one. That's my solution. That's also your solution. Maybe there are others. Um, so, how can we identify non-structural properties or statements? Yeah. Um, why is this important at all? As a mathematician, you might say, well, I know what, are the, what the interesting, the invariant uh, properties are. I don't care. But sometimes it would be good to make things more explicit nevertheless. For instance, if we want to transfer constructions and not just proofs across an equivalence, across the sameness, then we need to ask not whether it transfers, but how it transfers. Yeah. And that's much more complicated, of course, to see. Um, secondly, the notion of equivalence gets more complicated when I look at more complicated higher categorical structures, for instance. And then it might not be that obvious anymore. And thirdly, of course, we are all here um, to discuss machine-assisted proofs, and machines need usually all the details. Maybe at some point they will not need all the details anymore, and uh, artificial intelligence uh, will take over, but for now we have to give all the details to the, uh, to the machine to check. Okay, so mathematicians and logicians have thought a long time uh, about this problem of, of transfer, and here is a quote by Michael Mackay, who was interested in building a categorical foundation of mathematics, and he um, explains, he calls what I call equivalence principle, he calls something similar, the principle of isomorphism. He says that the basic principle, the basic character of this principle is that of a constraint um, on the language of abstract mathematics, a welcome one, since it provides for the separation of sense from nonsense. Okay. okay. And in particular, motivated by, by this work by Michael Mackay, uh, Vladimir Vovotsky, uh, work towards or develop the univalent foundations and the univalence principle uh, with the explicit design goal of having an invariant language. And invariance, not only um, going further than Mackay, having a language that um, is not just invariant, uh, does not just discuss uh, invariance for, for statements, for properties, but also for constructions. That is, uh, the, his goal was that any construction on objects in univalent foundations can be transported along equivalence of objects. And here I'm quoting from an email from Vladimir Wawotsky to Dan Grayson, who is also here in the audience. Can you wave? Yeah. Um, from 2006, about a, uh, a theory, a foundation that he was working on at the time, called homotopy lambda calculus, uh, of which he says that it's an attempt to create a system which is very good at dealing with equivalences. Yeah. And then there's something technical that I will let you read on your own. The slides are online, by the way. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, now I fast forward a little bit. In univalent foundations, so that is sort of the, the, the end result of, or a partial end result of, uh, of, the, of the development of univalent foundations is that we can show an equivalence principle for groups, for instance, or for categories. And here, what is important is we can show that, uh, so this is a statement within, uh, within univalent foundations, we can show that any, uh, any property on groups transfers across an um, equivalence of, uh, sorry, an isomorphism of groups, and any property on categories transfers across an, um, an equivalence of categories. And in univalent foundations, when we state this property, we don't need to know anything about P other than that is a, it is a property of categories. Yeah. So we don't need to know, we don't need to filter our predicates for whether they are group theoretic or category theoretic or anything. So, so is we, I am equal to A, not a category theoretic? Not a valid thing to say. Basically. Sorry, can you say that? Is I am equal to A? I am is equal that not to a, a valid. Yes. That's not a, a valid thing to ask. That's a valid thing to that say. That is valid. It is valid, yeah. Uh -huh. It is a valid predicate P. So does that make so the error? So it's satisfied by this. Sorry? So does that make the arrow go the other way? I think that's the direction yeah. Kevin is going. Right, you're but one step from it has a different the univalence axiom. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, as Stan points out, when I use for P the predicate um, being equal to A, then this equal means equal in the sense of univalent foundations means uh, and will unfold to being equivalent. I see not an isomorphism, it'll be an equivalent. In between, for, so for, for, for categories, ca for categories yeah. the notion of categorical isomorphism and the notion of categorical equivalence will also coincide. So okay. Okay. We have three things that are the same for categories, the identity type, the type of isomorphisms and the type of equivalences. Thank you. By the same, you mean equivalent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the, the word category means something slightly different. We will get to that exactly. Thanks. Um, before I come to categories, but I will come back to your point, yeah, I will explain what, what I mean by category. Um, I will give a brief description of the technicalities of univalent foundations. Not very technical, but just just a little bit, to also to clarify the difference between, for instance, univalent foundations and the lean type theory that will also be discussed during this week, or has already been discussed to some extent. Okay, um, the technical basis for univalent foundations, um, at least for the, the first version of univalent foundations, people are still developing new, improved versions of univalent foundations, uh, is Martin Love type theory. And in Martin Love type theory, one can write things like this. So uh, the first thing that one has is dependent types. Uh, for instance, if one has a natural number n, then one can form, uh, well, the, the predicate uh, is even. So is even of n would be uh, a type. It would be the type of proofs that n is even. You know, that can be uh, inhabited or it can be empty. Um, we also have a universe in or many universes in Martin Love type theory. And when I say x colon u, I mean, x, I mean that x is a type. And then on x, I can consider the type of group structures on, on x. Yeah. So x is a carrier, and I have a multiplication on x and so on. Actually, it's very similar to what I've uh, written down here. Um, here I have a, a quite not uninteresting, boring mathematical statement. Uh, for any natural number uh, n, uh, there exists possibly, well, there exists a natural number k such that n plus n is 2 times k. So this could be a formalization of uh, the statement that, any, uh, that for any number n, n plus n is even. And it would look like this. And here I have the definition of a monoid so as a sort of an algebraic structure where a monoid consists of a type m. So this sigma means building tuples, building pairs. Yeah? You have an iterated pair construction. Uh, a monoid consists of a carrier M, so it's a type, 
multiplication, a unit element, um, and some axioms. Benedict, are the, are the sigma and the pi symbols used in the second, same way in the second bullet point and the first? Because it seemed that in the, in, the, in the middle bullet point, it seemed that you were using the product symbol to mean what I would say for all and the si sigma for there exists. Yes. Yeah. Modifier. yeah, that's what I mean. Do you consider that this, this, is the notation is somehow the same in the bullet point two and bullet point three? Yes. That's the beauty of our Okay. Uh. Unless I made a mistake somewhere, but I think so here you can read this as for any natural number n, there exists something. Okay. And but this is not really an exists. It's not a not not a, a classical exists. It's a, a, um, a constructive exists. So you can say it's it's a type of functions that associates to any natural number n a, a pair of a natural number n and a proof that of okay. this equation. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So this is really a pair. So this is a function. This is a type of functions that gives for for an input gives you a certain output. The, the point is that having such a function is the same thing as knowing that something holds for all n. Because the function is showing that it holds for all n, and constructively, there is no difference. Yeah. The the point of this, the po it's not super important to understand how to express things in type theory. I just want to make clear that one can express all sorts of things in type theory, and of course this was all already clear from the first talk, but I didn't know the content of the first talk. Um, so yeah, I, I w just wanted to illustrate uh, by example the way mathematics is phrased in, in type theory. Okay. Um, we have already seen that there is something uh, of this equality type, it appeared here briefly. Uh, so what it is, is that whenever we have two inhabitants x and y of the same type, we can form the type of identities between these two elements. And uh, we use suggestively this symbol, this equality symbol, uh, to denote this type, so x equals y is a type. Um, it does behave like equality in some respects, but it also behaves unlike equality in some other respects, yeah? and this is the purpose of this slide. So we do have certain properties that uh, you can say uh, turn, turn this uh, relation that it is um, into something like an equivalence relation. Yeah, so we're it's not a relation, right? I'll come to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm calling it relation, but uh, that's a lie. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have uh, something like an equivalent pseudo-relation, uh, reflexivity, symmetry, transitivity. Um, we have also this very important transport principle, which I had, uh, which is uh, similar to what I sh have shown earlier, the indiscernibility of identicals, meaning that if we have a proof or a, a, an inhabitant of this identity type from x to y, then any construction, so here x and y are elements of type A, and B, you can think of B as a construction using uh, those elements, a construction over A. For instance, if A is sets and B is group structures on, 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 on x or y or so, then uh, we get an equivalence between the construction B over x or over y. Okay. But uh, what is different between the identity type and the uh, old equality that we know? Well, firstly, we can iterate the identity type. So if, uh, if we have two identities from A to B called P and Q, we can form the type of identities from P to Q. So we can ask whether two identities are equal themselves, which is not something that we usually do in set theory. Um, and as was pointed out, we cannot show, so it's, this is not a relation in the sense that we cannot show that P and Q, two parallel identities, are always identical themselves. Okay? And thirdly, another important difference is we can also form the, the type of identities between two types, X and Y. And this is a well-formed type, but we don't know what its inhabitants are. Okay, so it's just in pure modular type theory, we don't know. We, can, it's, it's, we cannot construct, other than reflexivity, we cannot construct any, any elements. So you can't construct a map from X to Y? If you Sorry? Say, so you're saying 
You can't construct a map from X to Y. Oh, I can construct an, a map from X to Y, but this, uh, until now, this is not the type of maps from X to Y. This is the type of identities from X to Y. Right, so given a term of that type, can I construct yeah. a function from X to Y? Using yes. Transport? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely. So if you plug in here this thing, then you can uh, construct... Uh, and here you can plug in the identity, then you get a map from X to Y. Does it make sense to ask whether if two, if two different terms give you the same function, are they the same term? Or we, will, we will come to that in just a second, because this is exactly the purpose of the univalence axiom. I'm just trying to understand the last thing. You, this inhabitant's not determined. I'm trying to work out what that even means. Martin Love did not give any useful axioms that would tell you what's in that type. Okay, I see. Okay. That's, that's the way to read it. I see. I see. So there are two important features of univalent foundations. The first one is the homotopy levels that give a stratification of the types according to the, the complexity of their identity types. I will not very much discuss that. The univalence axiom that is now that specify, that's a specification of the identity type uh, of the universe of two types, we have a canonical map from the identity type between two types, x and y, to the type of equivalences between x and y. And this can simply be defined by uh, mapping reflexivity on x to the identity equivalence on x. And the univalence axiom says that this map is an equivalence itself. In the sense that it gives you a map the other way, or it says there exists a map the other Well, way? it's stated as an, as an axiom. But, but so being, sorry, being, being an equivalence uh, is, so now we're getting into the technicalities. Being an equivalence uh, is, it gives you a map backwards, but since this map is unique, it's, it's, a, it's an axiom still. It's, it's, it's um, property, it's not data, mm -hmm. not, not structure. Yeah. And so this univalence axiom uh, sort of, uh, takes care of this incompleteness here that we have. Okay. So to 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 put this embed this into a bigger picture, maybe this this development. So we started with Martin Love type theory, and then we have some incompleteness, which is that the identity type of the universe of the identity type between two types is not specified. And there are two, two ways of dealing with that, uh, if one wants to deal with that. Of course, one can just live with this incompleteness. But if one wants to deal with it, one can add axiom k, which is an axiom that just um, equalizes all uh, terms, all parallel identities. Okay? It, says that the, it, it, it says that there's at most one identity between two elements. And then, we arrive in the world of lean and acta, where a type together with, with its identity type sort of represents a set. Okay. Or we can add the univalence axiom, and then we do not consider just the type with its identity type. Obviously, here we do have, formally, we do have the higher identities, the higher identity types, but uh, they are boring. Yeah? They are always. Uh, um, uniquely inhabited. So here, um, we do have the type, with the tower of the type and its identity type and the identity type of its identity type and so on. And it, there's no axiom that makes it trivial, so we need to consider the whole sequence. And that sort of represents or can be interpreted as by a notion of space. I will not exactly say what I mean by space, for now at least. And that uh, gives us univalent foundations. How do I do with time? Okay. Um, so that concludes the technical discussion of what univalent foundations are. Are there any questions at this point? Can I just ask a question? There's a toe beginner, but if I think about two sets and a map between them, they don't need to be equal. At two sets and they? And, a, and so imagine, so I have two sets and I have two parallel arrows. Yeah. Then I was a bit confused by. So you, you're saying axiom k says these two arrows are the same? Or? No, axiom k says that if I have uh, 
So these are two types, yeah? And Axiom K just says, if I have, um, no, I, we don't need actually to look at uh, type specifically. Axiom K says that whenever I have a type A, and I have two inhabitants of that type, X and Y in A, um, and I have two, um, sorry, P and Q are both um, identities from X to Y. Okay, I have two identities from X to Y. Then I can prove, uh, well, I cannot prove it, but I can state it as this axiom, axiom K, that P, then I get a, a sort of K, I get a proof that P is identical to Q itself. So any two identities between X and Y are identical themselves. I've not talked about maps of, between types, but what it means uh, for what it means for two types themselves also is, is just the same. Um, it, this axiom doesn't give me a way to specif to, to construct any identities between types uh, that I that don't come from this um, from this sorry from this structure up here. Yeah? So between two types, I will always have. Between X and X, I will always have the reflexivity. But otherwise, there's, uh, and of course, I can, I have uh, symmetry or, or if you want, in, inversion and composition of these uh, identities. Um, but with axiom K, there's no way to relate this type with the type of equivalences between two types. Yeah? Doesn't say anything. The univalence axiom, on the other hand, says that this type is equivalent to this type, and not via just an arbitrary map, but via the map that sends the identity, uh, the reflexivity here, to the identity here. And then it, uh, you can show that this map also preserves uh, composition of, so com composition in, in this term here, um, this is sort of this composition translates to composition of equivalences on this side. Okay. Yeah. Think of why is a variable. Okay. Any other questions? Doing it for all y So, as a sort of summary on univalent foundations, this is uh, taken from a talk by Bobotsky, um, one year approximately before he died. Um, mathematics is the study on structures. Uh, of structures on sets and their higher analogs. And what it means by higher analogs is not categories and higher categories, but it's groupoids and higher groupoids. Um, set theoretic mathematics constitutes a subset of the mathematics that can be expressed in univalent foundations. So here by set theoretic mathematics, uh, I think at least my interpretation is that that also refers to things like lean and acta in standard mode, because that's essentially set theoretic mathematics. And similarly, classical mathematics is a subset of univalent mathematics consisting of the results that require the law of excluded middle and or the axiom of choice among their assumptions. Okay. How much time do I have? Ten minutes? Okay. Um, I will skip this. Um, just want to show that, so Wawatsky thought about these foundations of mathematics, and at the same time, and I think because he was motivated by um, computer proof assistance, um, and here uh, I'm, I'm having an excerpt of Wawatsky's um, Koch library that he started writing in 2010 where he kind of develops the, the, the univalent foundations, not just in his head and not just from a semantic point of view, but also from a syntactic point of view. Um, here I have the definition of, it's very difficult to read, I think, but it's also not important, of, of the homotopy levels. That was the second, uh, the, the, the second of the important points of univalent foundations. So he started writing this library in 2010 and this library and other libraries built on top of his library called Foundations were later combined into what is now called the Unimath Library of, uh, of uh, Univalent Mathematics. And I will 
talk about this a little bit more uh, in just a second or minute. Okay. Now, finally, we come to category theory. Um, what is category theory? So, sorry for everybody who knows what category theory is, but I think um, it's, it's good to give an idea why is it important at all. Well, category theory is a general theory of mathematical structures and the relations. And while it was originally developed to do some, to conceptualize constructions in algebraic topology, it is now uh, a very important theory in, 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 well, in almost all of mathematics, I would say, but also in computer science, in biology, and so on. And there are even there's a conference series dedicated to applications of category theory in all sorts of different disciplines. Um, categories are defined for any dimension. Yeah? I will not explain what I mean by dimension. I will only talk about sort of the one-dimensional, the, the simplest kinds of categories. Um, but much of what I will say will hold for higher categories as well. Um, why would one be interested in formalizing category theory? There are some generic reasons that hold for any kind of mathematics that one might want to formalize. Um, the reasons that are specific to category theory, at least that ones that I could come up with or that I'm interested in is, firstly, that category theory is quite complex. The structures are huge, and so it's easy to make mistakes. Um, secondly, as I've tried to point out or to explain, is that category theory is so uh, useful in other areas of uh, endeavor, in other uh, scientific disciplines, that I believe non-experts will increasingly use category theory in their work, biologists or computer scientists. And then having a formal library can make that, can, can help I think the term black box was maybe used. They can use maybe category theory as a black box um, or in, in, in their work. And a more uh, speculative point is that uh, there are graphical tools for reasoning in higher categories. Uh, tools like um, homotopy IO and globular that are graphical tools that, where you can um, that work in terms of string diagrams for categories. And you can implement your reason with a drag and drop tool. But these tools are all not formalized. They are just implemented by some, using some algorithm that is not in itself formalized. And it would be cool to connect these graphical tools to um, a, a formalization in a computer proof assistant and have a, a, um, a translation between these, these two things. OK. So what is a category? Well, a category consists of a collection of objects. For any two objects, a collection of morphisms. And then I have uh, certain operations on these morphisms and uh, certain laws that this composition should satisfy. And there are a bunch of examples here of categories, sets and functions, groups and homomorphisms, models of programming languages, and translations between them, so on. Um, and this talk. In some sense, it's only about the meaning of the word collection here in these two lines. Yeah. If I were to formalize category theory in set theory or in lean, I might write, want to write down the following definition. What is a, so a category is given by, well, a set of objects. And here, set could be type if I were to work in lean. And for any two objects, a set of morphisms between those objects, and then identity and, and axioms, identity composition and axioms. So I call this a set-based definition of categories. And just to be clear, Benek, when you say you might, is, is this actually how the notion of category is formalized in Lean? No. Yes, there's two choices for you. Yeah, Mod you modular universities. Yeah, uni modular universities. Yeah. yeah, so I'm glossing here over a technical detail, which is that any any, well, here, here actually, here are the universes. Here is the universe U, and here is the universe U as well. We have a universe V, but that's Could the be two different universes. <laughs> oh, you call it V? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you and V, <laughs> there, they have two of them. So well, there are small two. categories and large categories. Oh, for morphisms <laughs> and other. But the definition is unified. But, but that's not important. Yeah, we can, this, this, we can just pretend that there is one universe and that things usually work, work out well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
There's another, an alternative definition, what I call a space-based definition of categories, where this is, for now it's essentially the same definition, but I have replaced the, the use of the word set here and here by the word space. Okay, a space of objects, and for any two objects, a space of morphisms. Um, again, without explaining what I mean by space. Uh, except that when I give this definition, uh, I have to be more careful. There's um, redundant, there's uh, superfluous data that I need to kind of uh, get rid of. Um, namely, firstly, I would want to ask that the space of morphisms between any two objects is not any space, but a discrete space. That has to do with the fact that I want these things here to be um, property and not data. Um, and there is a second um, condition, which I call the completeness condition here, is that I have a map, a canonical map, from the identities between any two objects A and B to the isomorphisms between any two objects A and B. And this map should be an equivalence. And with this requirement, I can um, I postulate that the sort of the the homotopy or the, the, the spatial aspect of between the objects coincides with the categorical structure between these objects. Okay. Um, this is an aside about this notion of space-based mathematics. Yeah, it's not something that uh, was invented with univalent foundations. Uh, for instance, in 2001, uh, the, Charles Resk, he developed a notion of complete Siegel space as models for infinity one categories where uh, he uses spaces. It's important that, so Resk spaces were themselves built from sets. So you might ask, where's the gain? Yeah. Um, for us, it will be important that our, we have a proof assistant that where the notion of space is primitive. So there's actually, we can gain something. Yeah. In, 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 uh, in, in Resk's work, um, he needed to break down or to formalize the notion of space in terms of sets and themselves. And our space-based definition of category that I put on the previous slide uh, is actually, it's a truncated version of this definition by Resk. Yeah? With this, uh, the completeness condition is this one here. Well, is ISO AB defined using the category theory? Sorry, is? ISO AB is a pair of maps from A to B and a B to A. Oh, sorry, yeah, I should have been more, uh, given more detail. So ISO AB is the type of isomorphisms from A to B, and it's defined using the composition and the identity and these actions. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, this, so this, uh, there, if, I, if I give this definition, I have, on the one hand, I have this information about the space of objects, and on the other hand, the information about these isomorphisms between objects. And I want them to coincide, these two things. Okay, uh, there are other um, space-based mathematics, instances of that, of space-based mathematics, for instance, these H spaces, which are space-based groups somehow. Um, there's also a team that develops uh, um, group theory most very systematically, and I think Dan Grayson is part of this team, um, in terms of spaces. It doesn't, isn't space-based mathematics go back to Grayson basically? Like uh, yeah, if you want. I mean, I'm just I'm just pointing out the examples that I'm very that I'm familiar with, but there might be many more. Uh, not saying that this is an exhaustive list. Probably goes back to something pre-Cantorian, doesn't it? Pre-Cantorian. That's an interesting phrase. So, if we formalize uh, categories in univalent foundations in the way that I showed, then we have this equivalence principle for what I call these complete categories, and it's this completeness that makes it um, work. So any, and it's just a copy of what I said earlier, uh, any property or any construction even of uh, uh, on categories can be transferred across uh, equivalence of categories. Um, we also have a free completion operation to build complete, so to, to turn an incomplete category into a complete one. And there are other advantages of uh, space-based category theory. For instance, 
the universal objects are unique actually up to identity, not just essentially unique, which you might think is a tautology, but it makes things easier because you don't have to choose whether you want your limits to, um, well, since they are unique, uh, there's no difference between limits as structure or as property. Um, sometimes it helps one to do without the axiom of choice uh, because one can show that an essentially subjective and fully faithful functor admits a quasi inverse, so is a, is a real uh, equivalence of categories um, without the axiom of choice. On the downside is that this completeness condition can be difficult to, to prove. Um, I will do this very quickly, I'm already over time. Um, there's a real need for technology. No. You got about uh, five minutes. Okay, how oh, fantastic. We started late. Yeah, because we started at, one, at 15. Fantastic. Um, then I will calm down. <laughs> um, so, sh showing that this map is an equivalence is very complicated when A and B are sufficiently complicated uh, objects. Yeah? And in particular, so when, when A and B consist of many spaces and operations on those spaces, if you want. Um, and then it is very useful to stratify the category of these objects into layers. And I will not explain in great detail how this works, but here, here I have decomposed sort of the category of groups as a toy example into layers, how I can build it. Um, namely, I can start with the category of sets that I know very well, and then I can... Uh, so here K holds everywhere, right? Sorry? K, we have K. Except mm -hmm. K. K? We have axiom K. Right? Definitely not. Oh, not for these sets. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. For this uh, category of sets. Yeah. yeah. Here, here. Yeah, category of sets. I'm, I'm you never see these higher spaces in group theory. Yes, right. exactly. So here, sorry, I, I had misunderstood your question before. Here, I don't want axiom K, uh, axiom K, but when I talk specifically about the category of sets, I mean types that satisfy axiom K, which in that sense is not an axiom, but a property yeah. of types. Yeah. But the point is equality of these two types might not satisfy axiom K. Yes, 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 exactly. Sorry, I <laughs> misunderstood. So for this toy example, I uh, can take the category of groups. Uh, I can build it by starting with the category of sets, so types that satisfy axiom K. And I can stack on top what we call displayed categories. Uh, for instance, we can put a layer of uh, binary operations on this category of sets in the form of displayed categories and a layer of unary operations and a layer of uh, nullary operations. And each of these different layers, I can, for each of these layers, I can prove separately this completeness condition. Yeah? And so then, you're saying that the completeness condition always holds, it's a meta theorem, but in each case you have to construct it? No, it, it doesn't always hold. Okay, uh, so I nice. have to be clever. But uh, so th this is about. How I, can show, how I can show that this holds for certain categories. I cannot show it, for, for, I mean, it's built into the definition of category. So as part of building a category, I need to show this, I need to prove this, yeah? And how do I do it, for instance, in the case of the category of groups? And the, the important formalization technology, which is not a, not, yeah, it's not only for formalization, for computer formalization, but uh, it's particularly useful when we implement this in a computer proof assistant, is that I decompose this, the construction of this equivalence, or the proof that this map is an equivalence, into, um, into layers. I decompose this problem into layers, and we do this by a notion of displayed category, which you can think of as a, the data of a, of a category uh, indexed by the data of an underlying category. Um, I'm not going into the details of this, so I don't give the definition of what a displayed category is, but important definition is then that of a total category. So if I have a category C, for instance, a category of sets, and then a displayed category D over it, for instance, the category of, the displayed category of group structures on the category of sets, then I can form the total category um, 
and the total category has a spaces of objects and morphisms, suitable pairs CD of objects and morphisms in C and D. Okay? And the theorem that I forgot to put on the slides is that if C is univalent or is complete, sorry, is, is complete, and D is complete in a suitable sense, then this total category is complete. So this allows to uh, decompose this difficult problem um, into many easy problems or easier problems. And the building blocks, in particular in computer uh, formalization, that's important. The building blocks can be reused, so I can reuse this layer when I construct the category of oops, or the category of um, monoids, or the category of whatnot, I don't know. Um, I can just reuse these things. This is not, this is sort of a, a, a formalization technology that is not, uh, it is a, a mathematical thing, so it's a, a device within the theory, it's not, not uh, has nothing to do with smart tactics or so, um, but it, it's, in some sense, uh, it's still a formalization technology. Um, and it generalizes to, to higher categories. Okay. Um, okay. I will come to my summary. Building mathematical objects from spaces instead of sets has some advantages, is what I tried to explain, specifically when working with higher categories. Um, univalent foundations and proof assistance built on, oops, proof assistance built on univalent foundations have spaces as primitive objects, so um, in that sense, I think it's my belief that univalent foundations uh, can serve as sort of a domain-specific uh, uh, foundation for category theory and higher category theory. And there is some cost in building things from spaces. Uh, as I have explained, one has to show this completeness condition, um, but that cost can be uh, managed rather efficiently, uh, reasonably, in a computer proof assistant. Thank you. <laughs>